Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for staying. We have an exciting conversation that we're going to have right now. I'm Gina Burkhart, the CEO of Jobs for the Future. And our work touches all of those opportunity points that helps learners succeed from education through career. And so we do early college work. We do pathways to prosperity. We do workforce training and development. So um, we're happy to be here. We're happy to be part of the program. And I get to introduce the two most wonderful um, freshmen from the 114th Congress. What they don't know, or maybe they do know, is that last night, two of their senior senators had a similar panel, but they got Chuck Todd. You get me. <laughs> Next time, maybe, right? If you do good and do well. Maybe you can have him next time. So I'm going to ask you um, to share Congressman uh, Garrett Graves, the Republican uh, member of Congress, Congress representing Louisiana. Did I say that right? Say it. That word, Louisiana. Well, Louisiana. No. Louisiana. Louisiana. There, there you go. He's on the um, House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, and we're happy to have him here. And we also have Seth Moulton from my new home state of Massachusetts. And <laughs> someone likes you, Seth. Um, he's on the House Armed Services Committee. So I'm going to ask them. You can clap. Go ahead. You can help. <laughs> I'm going to ask them both, since all day we've been hearing really touching stories about an opportunity moment. And both of these men are highly successful and have highly responsible jobs and we count on them. They're our hope for the future. So we're not going to talk about the partisan politics, but we are going to talk about what has brought them here to this conference and to ask them to tell us a little bit about themselves and their most important opportunity moment. So Seth, you want to start? Sure. So for me, this whole deal of being in politics is not what I expected to be doing with my life. It's totally new. Um, I've been in politics, I guess I was running for a year and a half, but I've been in this job for seven weeks. And before that, I really wasn't involved in the political scene. I hadn't run for office, I hadn't been involved in a campaign, um, wasn't a member of the Democratic or Republican club in college. But when I was in college, I was influenced by a mentor. Uh, his name was the Reverend Peter Gomes, and he was this larger-than-life figure at um, on, on the college campus. He was the campus minister, but also the professor of one of the most popular courses uh, at Harvard. And he talked a lot about the importance of service, about how it's not enough just to believe in service or support those who serve. You ought to find a way to serve yourself, or you yourself to serve. And so I looked at different options. I looked at the Peace Corps, I looked at teaching overseas, but I had so much respect for the young men and women who serve on the front lines of our nation's military that I decided that that's where I would like to serve. Now, my timing was kind of auspicious because I graduated in June of 2001. So I had no idea when I made this commitment to join the Marines that September 11th would happen, and soon thereafter I found myself in the Iraq War. But it was that experience in the Iraq War, of being in a war where I feel like Washington really didn't know what they were doing when they got us in and then didn't have our backs while we were there, that eventually inspired me to run for Congress. There was a day in 2004 when a young Marine in my platoon said, you know, sir, you ought to run for Congress someday so that this doesn't happen again. And although I didn't decide at that moment that I'd run for Congress, when this opportunity came around, I thought back to that young Marine and the obligation that members of Congress have in this important role, uh, this leadership role in the country. So that's kind of how I started on this service journey. Thank you. Um, that was great, and, and uh, a little bit <laughs> uh, a little bit of a similar background, and um, and that I, I'd never run for office before, and never had intentions of of doing this uh, ever. Uh, you would have told me 15 months ago um, that I was going to be running for Congress uh, and would be here today. I would have put my life savings on the table. You guys all could have walked away with a great <laughs> bet. Uh, 
And, and um, so I grew up in a, in a big family in South Louisiana. And uh, my, my father's father died when he was 16 years old. Um, I was the fourth of five kids. We had two bedroom house, two beds pushed together, and the kids all kind of crashed there. Um, uh, and my father uh, did land surveying and then went on to, to do civil engineering. And so um, growing up, he says, you know, land surveying. So I'm, here I am, a young teenager, and I'm going to get into land surveying. And so during the summers, I start, and it's South Louisiana, and I'm out in the swamps, and I've uh, got snakes and alligators and mosquitoes and, you know, you name it, all the great things you guys think about, they were there. Uh, <laughs> and, and, of course, the humidity and the heat. And, and I did it, and, and so that was my first real exposure to work. And I'm sitting there going, gosh, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure I like this work thing. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, the real, um, what ended up happening is that um, I got involved, and this is a, just a real anomaly, being in South Louisiana, uh, I got involved working for an outdoor program, an outdoor education program. I loved working with kids, I loved the outdoors, and I started doing that. So I got into mountaineering, and growing up in South Louisiana, I got into mountaineering, <laughs> and, um, and started teaching uh, outdoor education. And my whole definition or, des or you know, kind of disposition or approach toward work fundamentally changed because I loved what I was doing. I loved working with kids, I loved the physical challenge, and I loved being in the outdoors. And so that was the real sort of aha moment in my life where I realized I had an entirely different perspective on work. I loved working with people and, um, and, and realized that through that experience, you could begin making a, 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 a difference in the lives of young people and um, sort of began turning toward this path of public service. And um, that's where it all came from. Thank you. So today, we've been having a lot of conversations about the importance of taking care of our opportunity youth and moving them into places that'll help our economy. What do you think an opportunity nation looks like and what role can you both play as you move through Congress to help us find that opportunity nation or continue to build the opportunity nation? Garrett, do you wanna? Uh, um, that's a, it's a great question. So. Uh, what's the role of Congress? What's the role of uh, the community? What's the role of, of, of uh, uh, corporate citizens? And I, I'm, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna talk about my experiences. Um, so uh, I talked about uh, sort of my initial job experience and how I didn't really think it was all that great. And then, you know, through uh, evolution and other jobs and opportunities and experiences found that where I absolutely loved and was very passionate about um, my work, my job. Um, I actually had a job for a while where I drove five and a half hours. I absolutely made less money every weekend than it took me to pay to fill my tank, but I did it because I loved it. Um, and so what I think we need to do is we need to help align people. We need to help align young people with the options that are out there. Give them the opportunity to taste, to see uh, uh, the, 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 the jobs that are out there to where you can align those people with their passion. Give them an opportunity to see that you know work is not all standing there with a uh, a weed blade a, a waist deep in a swamp in South Louisiana. If that's not what you want to do, uh, <laughs> I'm sure many of you would do great there. Uh, but, um, but but there are other opportunities to work where you where you um, you can absolutely fulfill your passion. You don't look at it like work. You look at it like service. I led an agency in the in the state of Louisiana um, on hurricane protection and coastal restoration. It was all about coastal sustainability, the communities, the ecosystem. And when I got there, we had three kinds of people. We, we, actually, um, we actually kind of built this new agency, but three kinds of people were there we inherited. Um, you had people that were there because they needed a paycheck. And you know, whether they were doing something in that office or you know, out there doing something else, they were there for a paycheck. Number two, you had people there, um, uh, I think, for the civil service aspects and the retirement and some of the protections associated with it. And number three is you had people there because they looked at it like mission work. Here it was, South Louisiana, a few years after Hurricane Katrina. These people wanted to go help rebuild and make a difference and change the future of New Orleans or the trajectory. And, um, and I'll tell you, I would take one person was there that was there because they wanted to be there, because, because they loved it, because they viewed it as mission work. I would take one of those 
for five in any of those other categories. And so that's what we need to do. We've got to stop, I think, looking at school as this one track that's isolated and careers and opportunities and options over here. They need to be integrated, the communities, the business sector. Um, giving people opportunities to internship, apprentices, give them exposure. And they're not gonna love all the, all the opportunities they have, but let them see what's out there and align them with their passions. Thank you. Sir? Sure, I mean, so first of all, I agree with everything Garrett said. He's absolutely, he's absolutely That's right. That's a good sign. Yeah, how about that? Agreement. <laughs> I talk a lot about bipartisanship, but I'll get to that. But, you know, <laughs> the, the, the point I would make is that I'm a big believer in national service. And I think this country would be a stronger country if we had more people involved in national service. When I told my own story, I didn't expect to get involved in the military. I didn't expect to serve the country. Um, but a mentor convinced me that it was a good thing to do. And frankly, I thought I would do my four years in the Marines, and I'd check a box, and that was it. You know, I'd, for the rest of my life, I would have served my, I will have served my country, and I won't have to do it again. And instead, I found that when I got out, I really missed it. You know, I didn't even agree with the Iraq War. I did four tours there as a Marine. I don't think it was a great idea. But every single day in Iraq, my work impacted the lives of other people. And that's an extraordinary position to be in, especially as a relatively young person. And it doesn't have to be in a war, either. Uh, when I came back from, the, from my fourth deployment in 2008, I went to this great summit uh, organized by Alan Casey and others down in, down in New York about national service. And it brought together people, veterans from the military, veterans from the Peace Corps, veterans from Teach for America, City Year, and I was amazed by how much I had in common with people who served at schools in New Orleans or on the streets of Boston or in rural farmland in Guatemala with the Peace Corps. We had this shared experience where we were able to come together with people from all over the country to do something to serve others. We learned a lot of leadership, uh, hard work, discipline in the process, but that service ethic pervaded what we pervaded our, what we had done and it really brought us together i couldn't believe how much i had in common as an iraq war veteran with people who had done teach for america or the peace corps it was the only that event that event alan you can correct me if i'm wrong but i understand it was the only joint campaign event of senator obama and senator mccain in the entire 2008 campaign so there are a lot of people out there on both sides of the aisle who recognize that national service would be good for the country. But it's not just good because it's a morally nice thing to do or it makes people better people. It's good because it's a good economic investment too. I, don't, I would never have gotten into business school with my grades from college, but my leadership <laughs> experience in the Marine Corps made me, made me a good candidate. And truly, that's, that's paid off a lot. So I think that you learn a lot from national service. I think that it brings people together from across the country. And I think it'll make our nation a stronger, a, a stronger country. You know, one of the, one of the points I make uh, sometimes with regards to this whole partisan divide in Washington, which, is, um, which has been so difficult and has really ground uh, our government to a halt, is that when I served in the Marines, I didn't have a platoon of all Democrats. You know, I had Marines from all over this country, from Massachusetts and Vermont, from Alabama, from Texas, from California, from a, from a gated community outside of Park City, Utah, and from inner city Brooklyn, New York. We came together with remarkably different backgrounds, different religious beliefs, different political beliefs, but at the end of the day, we were able to set aside those differences to do what's best for America. I think more people should do that, including us in Congress. So, I agree. And that's a segue to the next question. So, you're our hope for, if you, if you had been here today, you would have heard a lot of comments on the dysfunctionality of Congress right now, and that there's a real need for us to do away with the partisan pol politics to actually make something happen, because nothing is more important than taking care of our youth, and if we take care of the, our youth, our economy will be better, and in the long run, most all things will be better. So you've been there a short while. You've probably experienced some of the partisan nature. We're hoping that you have some ideas 
um, or that you've learned some things over the last little bit that can help change the conversation in Congress. Any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, one thing I'll say I do is I, I, just, I just try to meet people across the aisle, you know, because it, we, everyone knows that this partisan divide is a huge problem, and yet we came for freshman orientation, and 95% of our events during freshman orientation for Congress, which is kind of funny because the freshmen are all different ages, right? There are young guys, and then there are the 65-year-old freshmen, <laughs> but, um, but they're all divided by party. So, I mean, I didn't get to know you during freshman orientation because we were always doing different events. And so what I've tried to do is just get lunch with my Republican colleagues, get dinner. And a lot of times forming those personal relationships can be the foundation for professional relationships. But it's also why I think national service is good because you get together with people from so many different backgrounds. I mean, that's what everyone says about the World War II generation, right? World War II, Terrible that we had to fight it, but it brought all these different Americans together in a way they never, you know, people from Massachusetts didn't know people from Alabama before they had to serve together uh, in the Army or the Marines or the Navy. And, and that experience helped really gel people around a common goal, and then and that led to a lot of our success later on. You know, the greatest generation of World War II wasn't called the greatest generation in 1946. You know, that term didn't come around until the 1990s. So it had as much to do with what the greatest generation did after the war as what they did in it. Um, that's a great uh, assessment. And, and I really want to emphasize what, um, what Seth said opening up. Um, we've been in Congress, what, seven weeks now? Seven weeks. So we're pretty much experts. Um, <laughs> uh, but but, um, but the, the time that we've had to actually engage uh, together has been, has been very rare. Um, I think that today was the second time that, that Seth and I have spoken. Uh, first time was a fight. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, uh, but, but seriously, second time we, we've spoken. Right. And in, in just the, the, the five minutes we're, we're walking in here, we're sitting here talking. Obviously, he has good military defense background. We're talking through. He's sharing ideas. I think they're great um, and, and make a whole lot of sense. And I think there needs to be more opportunity for us to collaborate and not have other people telling us about the other parties but us <laughs> and, and the other people that are there, but actually spending time together. Um, I think the first time we met was actually at that bipartisan retreat. Right, it was, yeah. And this was an unusual moment where they, we did have an opportunity to go spend some time for a weekend. And, you know, we learned some policy, but I think more importantly, we learned about each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a great, a great event, a great policy and, and an opportunity for us to, to have an uh, interface with other, other freshman members. Um, and so that needs to happen. That, that interface, that time together needs to happen. Like I said, just spending five minutes walking, already agree with him on some of his ideas related to defense and foreign policy, um, makes a lot of sense. He's got good background, good experience, um, and, and obviously a good resource to rely upon for those issues. Um, and so we need, we need more opportunity to do that. But one of the other things is, um, uh, a lot of the sort of alignments on issues come down from leadership, they, they do. I mean, look at the, how the votes uh, come down. Uh, I think historically, at previous, uh, not previous, uh, I would say that at certain points in Congress, you saw people began rallying and caucusing around issues as opposed to around parties. And, um, you know, Congress has, has ebbed and flowed in, in different directions, but uh, I think that's something that needs to happen, is allowing people opportunity to discuss policy issues around uh, or have policy discussions around issues as opposed to uh, around party. But uh, this, this whole partisanship thing didn't happen overnight, and, there, and there, there's not any one thing that caused it, there's not one thing that's gonna solve it. Um, one of the other things that you, you, is, is I think you, you really can't deny is how these, these congressional districts are drawn up. Uh, the district where, where um, I'm representing, you can go into neighborhoods and on one side of the street you have one district on the other side of the street, the other. You can go down into the neighborhood, the back is one member of Congress, the front is a different one. Uh, the number of times I had to pull a map out during the campaign <laughs> to answer someone's question whether I was in their district, uh, excuse me, you know, they were in the district we were running for. Um, that's not how it should be. Um, because if you, if you isolate and say, okay, conservatives in this district and liberals in this one, then, then those people aren't gonna, the, the members of Congress aren't gonna have the tolerance from their constituents mm -hmm. to go across the line and, and work with other folks. So really all day, really yeah. 
hope. All day we talked about hope. Here's hope. Um, we also talked all day, Opportunity Nation has some action steps around train, hire, mentor, graduate, and revive. And you have organizations and individuals in the audience that are passionate and committed to these er areas and action steps. What do you need from them to help move this agenda forward for us? Garrett? Uh, sure. You know, um, one of the first things, my wife's a teacher. And uh, you talk about Yay. training, you talk about, she's, she's great. Uh, and, um, and we actually met teaching outdoor education courses. Um, but in, in, the, in the education or the teaching experiences that I had and, and, um, and in the ones that, that she does in her, in her life, um, the, the classroom today is still largely based upon a model that was around in the 1940s. Let's put a teacher in front of 25 students and we're gonna teach you something. We have three young kids now, and I'll tell you, that all this is based on my experience and the changes I've uh, and thought have, have, have resulted from that. We have three kids. Every single one of them learns very differently, very different kids, all bright, but they learn totally differently. How do you put a teacher in front of a classroom with 25 students and speak to all of them? How do you do it? I, there are schools, and I want to be very clear and give them full credit, there are schools that are knocking this out of the park today. But, but teaching to the aptitude or to the receptors of that student and, and, and teaching the way they learn to where the, the students can actually learn and they can realize that they have value, they, they, they're gaining knowledge. Um, it, we need to adapt the entire classroom experience and I think you know, with technology and many other innovations uh, have the ability to fundamentally change that experience to help provide an environment where kids can succeed. And the other thing I'm gonna go back and. Um, uh, and, and reference again, we've got to do a better job of breaking down the walls between schools and business. If you have someone locked up in a university, then all of a sudden, okay, here's your degree, go get a job, and these people are like, whoa, what do I do? <laughs> um, you've got to integrate that experience more to where when people are, you know, when they go from graduation to, to work, they know exactly what that experience is like. They know what private sector, public sector, whatever it is, because they had internships, they had opportunities to be there. And, um, and to learn how, or to see how the things they're learning in school actually apply in the real world. And, um, and help people, uh, give people an opportunity to be exposed to their passion. An opportunity yeah. for service learning. Yeah. So, that's Do you have it. anything to add, Seth? I mean, I'm not married, so I can't say my wife's a teacher, but my sister is a teacher. <laughs> All right, <laughs> and, great. Uh, and, she, and she teaches high school history, and, and she's awesome. Uh, you know, I honestly would like to, in a way, second what, what Garrett said, because I think that in America, we have this sort of education hierarchy. We all know education is important, and some people get to go to great schools, but some people are really talented who just don't succeed in the same ways that we traditionally measure success in academia today. Uh, one of the best leaders I've ever met in my life uh, is a guy named Greg Van Wyne. He was in my platoon. He was from Ankeny, Iowa, a real farm town. Um, he was kind of a, <laughs> some Iowans out there. All right, all right. You know, Greg was kind of a B, B student. He was on the football team, but I think mostly sat on the bench. So by sort of traditional measures of success, he wasn't a standout at all. And yet in my platoon, he was an extraordinary leader. Now leadership is actually really important to success in life. But I went, I went to Harvard. No one ever taught me about leadership at Harvard. I didn't learn about leadership until I went to the Marine Corps. So even at one of the best schools in the country, I didn't learn about leadership. But this guy, Greg, he really got it. And when I had a, another Marine who was having trouble or something, I'd put him under Greg's leadership and he would turn him around. And Greg got an award for valor after one of our um, battles and after he was awarded this um, medal. Um, I, I, I called him over and I said, you know what, Greg, you know what your problem is? I said, you just don't have any ambition. You could be a CEO of a Fortune 500 company someday and you just don't know that. You are such a talented leader and I don't think you appreciate it. And he looked at me and he said, sir, that's the first time anyone's ever told me I'm good at anything. Now think about that. Think about absolutely one of the best leaders I've ever met in my life and yet our traditional education system just hadn't ever told him that he was good at this. 
So you've got to do well in school, but doing well is not the same for everybody. You've got to find your passion, like Garrett said. And we've got to help design an education system that recognizes different talents that, that people have. Mm -hmm. So. If I can, if I can make one, one last Please comment on, on, on this issue. Um, you know, I, I, I think in, um, uh, I think that we have largely established the goal line uh, for a student as soon as they get in preschool or, or kindergarten. Um, you're going to get the four-year degree, you're going to get the advanced degree, PhD, whatever it is. And, um, and, and we've, we've sort of created that, you know, a doctor, a lawyer, whatever it is, the, these are the, you know, that's your goal line, that's your objective. Um, and in Louisiana, we have $100 billion in economic development projects on the horizon. And I'll tell you, there's not a one of them that has a dang thing to do with a doctor or a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, it has to do with, um, with jobs and skills that I think um, largely have been frowned upon, and yet they're careers that you can walk out of uh, a technical college, a community college, you absolutely will be making more money than 90% of the people that come out with four-year degrees. And, um, and they're, they're huge careers, huge mm -hmm. opportunities. And, um, and, and, and so you look at the path of a student who may go on to school and feel like they're a failure and drop out of high school because they're looking at that saying, you know what, I don't have six more years in me, or I don't have uh, eight more years in me, or whatever it is. Um, we've got to show people that there are other opportunities there that are phenomenal. They're totally aligned with the, with the skills that, that some people have, and, uh, and they're great futures. So we need to redefine what success is. Well, you're preaching to the choir, and our hope is that by having been here for just these few minutes, that you'll take some time to actually interact with some, um, some of the audience later. Yeah, please, please interact with us. And uh, one more quick action step. If you're not following us on Twitter, or Facebook, please follow us. My, my Twitter is Seth Moulton, so S-E-T-H-M-O-U-L-T-O-N. And it's uh, it's uh, R E P uh, Rep uh, Garrett G A R R E T Graves G R A V E S. Because they're going to take our message with them and help us make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.